I'm a baddie. It was two in the morning. My friends had me like leaned over and bent over in this dorm sink. I dyed myself blue. I dyed the shower blue and I had to miss my Spanish midterm the next day because I looked like a Smurf. Hi everyone, it's Maddie and welcome back to Closet Talk. It is episode six. It is the final week of my first six chapters and I just wanna check in with you. How are you doing? How are we feeling? I would love some reflection in the comments about how everyone has taken this journey and I really appreciate you all for being here. For these first six chapters, just to rewind, I've been talking about my queer identity journey from elementary school all the way up to the present day. And today we have made it to chapter six. I'm going to be talking about moving to LA and how I finally came to embrace my identity. But first, it's time to introduce today's iconic moment in queer history. Number six, what do we have? Style, period. The way people dress and how it reflects their queer identity. If we're talking way back in the day, 1900s, there were several slight things that people would do when it was quite literally illegal to be a gay person, would put on their body or wear as a piece of clothing to signify their queerness, like wearing lavender or wearing, this I found out today, an earring in their right ear. Yeah, so my bad, I had no idea about that. But there were certain things that I learned when I first downloaded social media and it became kind of these widely universal things. The origins are still a mystery and I'm actually going to go further into like the history of it later at home at 2 a.m. when I finally remember that we talked about this. But some of them are cuffing your jeans. I saw this video on TikTok like three years ago at this point. It was like, how to tell if a girl is bi. This is a very large stereotypical generalization here, all right? But it's the cuff jeans, the button down shirts, and thumb rings. I had no idea about that. I was texting my producer of this show last night and we're like, all right, what's our queer moment in history for tomorrow? And she texts me and she goes, oh my gosh, like silk chiffon and thumb rings. I was, and I literally had this like existential moment. I put down my phone and I just went like this and stuck out my thumbs and was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea about that one. So yeah, apparently that's a, that's a queer thing. Thumb rings. I literally just like them because I need th my jewelry on my fingers to not be touching each other. Like they can't make the clinky sound or I'll genuinely have a panic attack. Silver jewelry is apparently also gay, but it also like really depends on your skin tone. I know some people like, I cannot pull off gold at all. So that's why I do silver and carabiners. Hold on, let me just flash my crotch at you really quickly. Like wearing your keys on this thing. This is like an old withered Beats carabiner that came when I first got my pair of like Beats headphones. And it's, I just haven't changed it since. But funnily enough, I don't know if he's out or queer at all. But I was scrolling on TikTok one day and this was like a few months ago when I really wanted to start develop. Oh my gosh, wait, no, this was like nine months ago. I have a bad habit of saying yesterday when I mean five years ago. But there was this moment I was scrolling on TikTok and I saw Noah Beck say something about wearing his keys on his like pant loop. And I remember being like, that is so smart. Like I didn't realize it was a gay people thing yet. And... I went into my room and I found my old Beats carabiner. I remember having one being like, this is perfect. And ever since that day, thank you to Noah Beck, I have not worn my keys any other way. It was actually really annoying because like them in your pocket would be annoying. I don't really know what I did before nine months ago. Yeah, Noah Beck helped me discover my queer style. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> really appreciate that. And then this is a big one that I've known for a long time. This was probably the first queer style moment that I remember having was Doc's like Doc Martens. And I'd wanted some for so long because every single queer person I knew, I actually think I put this together myself. And then later on, it was like, you know, solidified in TikTok that it is a queer like accessory or style piece. And it's those black Doc Martens. And like the really short ones too, that kind of suck and like take nine years to break in. You have to wear like four pairs of socks when you first buy them or else they're gonna rip up the back of your foot. Yeah, those with like the little yellow lacing around the sides. I wanted them so bad for so long and I didn't get them until this year. So yeah, I'm 
just now coming out, guys. And I think the note here is that TikTok has been the definitive resource of my queer style. And whenever I have like zero outfit ideas, I literally just type in mask or chapstick, which I didn't realize that was a term, by the way, chapstick lesbian. What does that even mean? Like, where did that originate from? It's like a mix between masculinity and femininity, I think. It's like between the two. But I type in that and it's just like, it gives me so many queer outfit ideas. And I think literally social media is where I've gotten all of every single piece of like my style. And I think it genuinely helps so many people too, because I pretty much use TikTok as my Google search engine now. Like this morning I was like, healthy breakfast recipes. And I didn't type it into Google. I typed it into TikTok. And I do that with kind of every aspect of my life. But I think if you are young and struggling with queer style and you don't know how to dress, just go on TikTok. There are so many different videos about Dickies pants and wife pleasers and high Nike socks that will help you find your true queer style and identity. Very helpful. Highly recommend. Throughout my journey in finding queer style, I always touch on how recently I've been able to explore my queer style because up until the point where I moved to LA, before that, I had no idea how to dress, how to act, how to behave, and my life will make so much more sense to you if you go back, tune in to the last five episodes, and really build the foundation up until this episode, episode six, when I moved to LA. And moving to LA, has probably been, actually not even probably, we are going to go with the best decision I've ever made in my entire life. And I say that for a multitude of reasons, because of the people that I've met here, because of the sense of self that I've found within, and just a great place to go and live and escape for a while. And I do see myself here for a very long time. But after I had left college, the scope of moving to LA was not in sight yet. That was not something I had ever considered doing at all. LA seemed like this fantasy land, like Disney World or something. I just knew it was filled with a lot of like queer people. And so I was like, one day, maybe. But I was still really focused on nursing school when I left college and tried to focus on my mental health. And after going to intensive therapy for three months, I started to get better. And my life started to pivot and my mental health became a lot clearer. And I started to use social media as an outlet to preach positivity and being genuine to yourself because the second that I started to ask myself questions and truly discover the answer to those questions in terms of my gender identity, my sexuality, my life got happier and I became a happier person just overall. And I think social media for me really made sure that I had a safe place. And I always say that the second that I decided to give life a chance, life decided to take a chance on me and give me this platform that I always want to feel like is a safe place for people. Because the second that I started to just post about who I was, like, I don't know, I never did style, but it was mostly about like making silly videos with my sister. I got a job at a boba shop. I got a bob. I did wear my hair in a bob actually for the first six years of my life. We, we don't have to talk about it, but I got a job at a boba shop and I just started making like these boba drinks. I started talking about customer interactions and I realized that everyone is so much more alike than we actually want to admit. And when I started posting about like weird interactions with people that I had at Target, I literally created a community of Target employees by accident. And they were all in, up in my comment section like, oh my gosh, it's crazy when the customer service inventory boxes get all jumbled up. And then I had this massive community of like people who loved boba and were like share their favorite boba recipes in my comment section. And social media for me really just connected me to the rest of the universe and made me realize that there are so many other people out there that just exist on the same wavelength that I do. And even if we're all on different wavelengths, I think comment sections are a really interesting way to like gauge where people are at in life. And then I was always so afraid to talk about my gender and talk about my sexuality and really go into like the intimate details of my life, which I think this is what 
I'm using this podcast for is to like open up that avenue into being able to talk about things that I never really knew how to talk about in the past. And the reason I'm so comfortable is because my mom came into my room one day. Actually, I don't want to say she came into my room, barged into that room and was like, Madeline, why do you have a million followers? And I was like, mother, I don't know. I have no idea what's going on. She was like, all right, we need to change your name. So Westbrook isn't even my real name, plot twist. But yeah, I know. Crazy. Anyway, it's not my real name. She made me change my username from my real last name to a fake last name. And out of nowhere, I think I gained like 3 million followers in a week. And I had these management companies reaching out like, we want to help you make money. We want to monetize your accounts. And I was like, it literally felt like one of those episodes where it's like all of a sudden you're getting like this person blows up on social media and it's like this Netflix series and they're getting PR and there are people reaching out. And I was like, what's going on? And then I started to go into public. The first time I went in public, like period, during COVID or I guess after a little bit after the COVID cusp had kind of ended, I did social media for like six months during COVID when it was like, my mom my dad worked in the hospital my mom was a teacher we did everything from home we did not leave our house it was my sister's birthday and we left and i went down to like walnut creek in this like little shopping center and i couldn't go like 10 15 minutes without somebody knowing who i was and my mom was like what's going on and i was like i don't know mom like i'm kind of scared and at the time i think i had like three and a half four million followers but we went home that day and she looked at me and she was like you're good at this aren't you And I was like, I think so. Like, I think this is something that makes me happy. And my entire life, I like to call myself a hobbyist because every two months I would have a new hobby, whether it be calligraphy, photography, even like Legos. And I think nursing was a very quick like hobby for me. And then I was like, nah, this is not it. But social media is the one thing that clicked for me. I woke up every single day wanting to do the same thing, feeling motivated to post something new, feeling motivated to create something new. And that was something I had never experienced before. And I still have it. I still love what I do. So when my mom sat me down and was like, you love this. I was like, I love this, mom. Like, I think I really can do something here and create like a safe place for people who are like me. And at this point, my mother's redemption arc had gone a full 180. She was completely supportive in my identity and was is my number one fan i love both my parents she asked me if i wanted to do this full time and i was like i don't know i always thought i'd do nursing like this isn't something i could have ever considered as a career and she goes will you have like people in this fake business email that you created wanting to work with you and i was like that's so weird what do we do and she was like i think you can do this and i think that was the first time in my life my mother had given me an option and both of my parents had given me an option to follow my dreams. Like it wasn't really about getting an education, finding a high paying job. It was like, this is making you happy and I think you should take a chance on this. And they were my biggest supporters when I moved to LA. And let me tell you, after growing up in a very conservative environment to a very conservative college, to going back to your very conservative hometown during like Trump's re-election, era moving to LA after all of that was genuinely like breathing air out of a truffula tree after just breathing in that fake O'Hare air in Thneedville for so long I moved here and met just a plethora of people who identified differently we realized after like two weeks of living here that all of my friends are queer that we all have this one thing in common and I've genuinely never been surrounded by more just gay people in my life and it has just completely opened my eyes to this entirely new part of my identity that I felt like I really was suppressing my entire life because the first time I moved here I had never really dyed my hair actually we're gonna backtrack and tell a story of when I did dye my hair I looked like a smurf in college I was like you know what I'm gonna dye my hair because I'm a baddie I wasn't I didn't know how it was two in the morning my friends had me like leaned over and bent over in this like dorm sink and were dyeing my hair this like very blue black color and then I went to wash it out in the shower yeah I dyed myself blue I dyed the shower blue and I had to miss my Spanish midterm the next day because I looked like a smurf 
Now let's take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsors today at HelloFresh. I don't know about you, but when I'm having a busy, chaotic week, the last thing on my mind is what I'm gonna make for dinner that night. And it's not that I wouldn't love to make a home-cooked meal. It's just that researching recipes, shopping for ingredients, and cooking from scratch can be a lot of work. That is why I am obsessed with HelloFresh. They do all of the brain power and thinking for me. By creating new menus each month and shipping fresh ingredients straight to my house, all I have to do when I come home from a long, hard day is look at the recipe cards and boom, I've made a delicious meal. I can be the chef that I've always wanted to be without stressing over grocery shopping or searching for dinner ideas online. Now that it's fall and everyone's back to school or busy with work, sometimes you don't even have time to sit down for a huge elaborate dinner. HelloFresh has you covered there too. Their quick and easy recipes and 15 minute meals are made specifically for those days when you need a quick, healthy meal faster than takeout or delivery. And one of my favorite things about HelloFresh is that they curate their meals to match the season. As the weather cools down for fall, it is the perfect time to try those warm, hearty recipes like their mushroom ravioli and tomato cream sauce or their creamy lemon butter chicken. You can choose from 40 weekly recipes that range from vegetarian to family friendly to quick and on the go options. Don't let meal prep stress you out anymore. Go to hellofresh.com slash 50 closet talk and use code 50 closet talk for 50% off plus 15% off for the next two months. That's hellofresh.com slash 50 closet talk and use code 50 closet talk for 50% off plus 15% off for the next two months. Find out why HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Now on to the show. After that point, I was like, I'm never dying my hair again. But I moved to LA and was like, screw it. Let's dye half of my head. And that was my first time really like exploring with like different hairstyles. I had always had my hair the same exact way ever since I cut it. And then I realized after dyeing my hair, there were a lot of parts about my physical expression and appearance that I wanted to kind of tamper with and just experiment with. And I remember talking to my current roommate at the time, and I was like, or my roommate at the time, and was like, hey, I think I wanna start like dressing differently. We should go shopping. And so I started to kind of touch on the more non-binary, gender fluid parts of my identity that I never let myself explore before. Because before moving to LA, I pretty much was on the like line or existence of, I'm a man. I'm a male and I didn't want that anymore. Like there, that just didn't align with how I felt on the inside anymore. I saw the short hair, but I wanted to start experimenting with different things. I moved and I met people who developed my style and I met people who helped dye my hair and who would paint my nails and who would take me jewelry shopping and who would be like, okay, Maddie, like, what do you want to look like? And after that point of like letting myself just explore I found this nice little soft medium between like masculine and feminine that I had never felt before. I also didn't know really like the terminology of non-binary, of gender fluidity until I moved here. And then all these labels started popping up out of nowhere that I had never heard before. And I realized that I had so much to educate myself on in terms of the queer experience that I had never heard of before. As I'm like, you know, I say growing up, I always say I'm two years old in like adult world because that's how long I've been able to fully live an adult life by myself. I moved out of my parents' house and I've been in LA for two years. And the amount of things that I've learned in that time have been so monumental just to the development and happiness of my mental health and the development and the happiness of my queer identity, my gender identity and my sexuality. And I think the interesting part about gender identity is that it was a mental block for so long. It really wasn't about that physical appearance that I let myself explore. It was about how I was feeling on the inside. And the more I started to paint my nails, the more I started to wear jewelry, stopped with the constant suits. Every day in college, I wore suits. I looked like I was running for mayor. After I found that style that I liked, that hair that I liked, you know, I started like perming my hair. I started wearing rings every single day. I started to like look deeper than that and like within because I always explain my gender as like a mental block, like a gymnast has. My sister grew up doing elite gymnastics and I remember there was this one time she came home and she was like, I have a mental block. Like I can't get past this one trick. I was like, what do you mean? She goes, every time I go to throw this one trick, my brain doesn't let me. My body physically knows how. I know I can physically perform this trick, but my brain just shuts down and stops me from doing it. And so I always take that analogy and apply it to my gender because for so long, the more I'd start to think about it, 
the more I'd start to panic and the more I would just shut down and I wouldn't let myself think about it. And so I'm starting to unlearn that mental block even to this day because that's really the reason I have not spoken about gender online and identity online and or even like labeled my sexuality. I'm just like, I like women is because of that mental block. And I think the way that we're continuing to get past that and the way that a lot of people have that in their lives is just answering one little bit of a question every time. Like I always grew up with chest dysphoria, like looking in the mirror and being like, oh, my chest freaks me out. Like, I don't like it at all. Do I wanna wear a binder? Do I wanna wear a sports bra? I was wearing sports bras every single day. And I finally got to a point where I looked at myself in the mirror and said, are you ever gonna get top surgery? No. Okay, so this is something you're just gonna have to get used to and this is something you're just gonna work with. And so after that, I really started to answer all the questions that I had for myself. And I think it's this big, daunting, scary thing that a lot of people don't let themselves explore because it is a massive thing about yourself to explore. It's not this like small little thing in your life. Your identity can have a drastic effect on your mental health and the way that you kind of even go about your daily life. I met people who before they got top surgery like could barely function as human beings because the dysphoria was so intense. And I think continuing to just ask yourself a little bit about who you are on the inside, being gentle with yourself and giving yourself the time to figure things out is the most important part. You are on nobody else's timeline but your own. And that's something I figured out really recently too. And I have so many cute little people like asking me questions all the time about gender and identity. And I think it's lovely that I didn't figure it out until recently because I was patient with myself and I was like honest with myself and figuring out gender after sexuality is something that I all honestly always like correlated with each other. I was always telling myself like, yo, gender and identity and like sexuality, they go hand in hand. And I don't think that they do. I feel like I spent a lot of my time in LA, like at first kind of hiding and not wanting to go out into the queer space because I just wanted to focus on work. I was like, I moved to LA for work and I don't think going out and like partying is where it needs to be at. But my favorite story from the queer space is forcing my gay roommate to go out with me and a bunch of lesbians. It was probably the funniest night of my entire life because I went out and it was my first time ever being at like a queer bar or like a bar period. And I had no idea what to order. I had no idea who to talk to. I was like panicking because like I don't really do well in like social settings. I'm a very, very one on one person. And so, you know, my friends convinced me like, let's go out. And I'm dancing with all these lesbians and I look in the corner and there's my gay roommate making friends with all these lesbians, like getting their number and like talking to them about style. And I was like, this is so important. Like you don't really see these spaces mix very often. I always go out to bars or I used to always go out to bars and look at people and always recognize the fact that it was like gay men or lesbians and they were never in the same place so i thought it was so lovely that it was just a bar full of queer women and then my roommate just in the corner but this is also something like i refused to talk about online because it's a scary part of life that i don't think a lot of people touch on is you know the things you're exposed to when you move to a new place especially at this age I had never encountered drugs before, like period, until I moved to LA. And it feels so normalized here for some reason. Like you go into parties and they're just accessible to you. And I always told myself like I would never dabble in that. But there's something about like moving here and then being the only person that's not doing something that can kind of eat away at you as a person. And the first experience I had doing drugs is actually hilarious. So we're going to get into it. It was weed and it was me and my former roommate sitting in a house that was not ours. And the, the person who owned the house was not there. And we were like, what should we do? And he goes, we can get high. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is how it ends. Like he had to sit down and explain to me that it was legal. And I still didn't know weed was legal at this point. And he goes, I can call my roommate and he'll definitely have some. So he calls his roommate and we get this like very handmade, like rolled blunt and we smoke it and I feel nothing, like zero things. I just 
ordered $50 worth of Chick-fil-A and then watched an entire season of Inked on Netflix and passed out for 13 hours. And then after that, I realized, I told myself, it's not as big as a deal as you think it is. And so I let myself fall into this habit of engaging with weed every single day for two years, every day. I would get my creative stuff done in the morning and then in the evening it was something to like relax because I think this social media thing like drains you mentally every day, all day. You're constantly thinking about like, okay, how'd that video do? If it did well, okay, tomorrow I need to do an even better job, get an even higher views. If it did bad tomorrow, I still need to do a better job because it did bad yesterday, so I need to do a better job tomorrow. And it's that constant 24-hour cycle. I swear I spend half my time just sitting in my room, like staring at a wall. If if the FBI actually had cameras in my room, they'd be very concerned for me. I also like run around and be like this time lapse of me sprinting in circles and then sitting on my bed staring at a wall for 15 minutes just thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow. And I think I realized that weed helped break that cycle and just let me calm down. And it was a very lovely thing for a while to just use to like calm down. But then I started to realize how much of my life was like surrounded by this thing. It was like, I need to smoke to eat. I need to smoke to socialize. And like, I talk a lot, if you could not tell. And I realized when I smoked, I talked less. And then I realized like, okay, I also needed to sleep. And then I needed to like regulate my daily emotions. And that's something that is something that I did not realize was a very unhealthy cycle until much later. And it was probably two years after moving to LA it was amidst this move from my old place into my new place. I was going through a breakup. I was going through a pretty rough time in my life. And I decided to go out with my friend. We are not going to name drop here because he is a very lovely man. But this is why I decided to like get sober. I texted him one night and I was like, hey, like I'm having a really hard time right now. All I can think about is this breakup. I need to go out. I need to get this off my mind. He was like, I got you. He's like the biggest partier I know. And so we go out to this bar and we already drank when I was in my apartment and I was crossed and I went out and I still didn't know the difference between like different types of drinks, like alcohol. I just kind of drank like I didn't know the difference between the effects or like you shouldn't you should definitely not mix them, but I didn't know the difference in names. And so I started ordering things that I thought were the same that weren't. And so we were in this club that was so foggy. Like they had like 37 smoke machines for no reason. My friend was like two inches away from my face and I was grabbing his shirt just to like make sure I knew where he was because it was so foggy. And so we get really drunk and we go to this other bar and Things progressed with this one girl to the point where like we were kissing in the club. I don't know how to talk about kissing girls still, but we were kissing, <laughs> we were like dancing with each other. And the part that terrified me, that was that I realized in this moment, I had absolutely zero idea how to regulate myself because I remember nothing after going in to the third club and kissing this girl. And apparently we got in an Uber and I called my friend on FaceTime at three in the morning and I was laying in my bathtub because that became a very safe place for me towards the end of the move. Whenever I was stressed, I would just go lay in my empty bathtub. Apparently I had gone home, stripped and was in this bathtub. And I FaceTimed my friend to come over at like 3.34 ish in the morning. And so I wake up after remembering nothing, which is scary because I've seen this thing that's like blacking out is overdosing on alcohol. And there are very few times I've ingested alcohol, actually probably three, that I don't remember what was going on. And I freaked myself out because all I remember is opening my eyes to one of my best friends standing over my bathtub, looking at me, like shaking me, and then just like, trigger warning, throwing up everywhere. Like on me, on her, she, is like not the most muscular human being, by the way, manages to get me out of the bathtub with zero assistance from me and put me over this toilet. And then the next day, I had never felt worse in my entire life, mentally, physically, emotionally, I was going through turmoil. 
and realized that I was using all these things that I got exposed to right when I moved to LA as this crutch to kind of not deal with reality. And so I told myself, I'm going to do 30 days sober because there hasn't been a singular 48 hour period up until this moment that I have not gone without a substance in my system. And that's not healthy. Like that's scary. And I started to reflect on my past and like the memory loss patches that I had from weed. And like amongst this time, I think it was pivotal in my growth as a human being to like stop and recognize unhealthy behaviors before they really got out of hand. And I remember like laying in bed and being like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do 30 days sober. And I had never talked about my issues with substances online before because like that's just if you want to create like a safe, comfy environment for people, I didn't think going online and being like, I'm struggling was the best way to go about it. I thought continuing to be this positive force was the best way to continue. But then I realized that was greatly affecting my ability to communicate with the people who follow me in the first place because there was this like dark daunting thing over my life that a lot of people didn't see so I did like a 30-day sober challenge and every day I would do a different activity that would make me feel better about my day and it was like an ice bath or I figured out how to make like cute little paper mache flowers or I would do something nice for my roommate I would do something every day to better myself just a little bit And by the end of the 30 days, it was at Coachella. And my friends were like, Maddie, are you ready to drink? Like you did 30 days. And I looked at them and I was like, I am not over the situation that got me to this place in the first place. Like this is not my time. And so I did 120 days sober. And that's like so crazy for me because that sentence like six months ago would have been so confusing to me. I just leaned on everything else around me to like feel a little bit better and like kind of not acknowledge reality when it got really difficult. But the best thing about getting sober was the support that I had from everybody else around me in LA. And I think we all got to a place where we all experimented really young with a lot of things that you don't get exposed to until you really like are in a place that doesn't really have parental guidance and you can kind of start to make decisions for yourself and at 20 years old I think is when I started to really make decisions for myself and now like looking back I literally cannot express like how important that was to like my growth period because at that point I had been doing social media for two years I was at a pretty comfortable place with my gender and my identity and like moving forward, moving into a new place and finally like feeling okay with who I was as an overall human being was a perfect time to like get sober and reevaluate life and like start to pivot and do things that made me happy. And I think the most iconic moment about all of this is that I'm still like doing what I love to do in a place that like I feel better about who I am. For example, I get the most joy out of buying random things on Amazon at three in the morning, completely forgetting that I did that and then receiving the package the next day. So literally like three days ago, I go, to my front porch and there's this like a relatively small package. So I was like, oh, I probably bought socks because I genuinely need more socks. I have like three pairs and open this box. It is an inflatable kid's tent, like an inflatable UFO kid's tent. And I got to inflate it in my living room. And then at that moment, I was sitting in this UFO tent, laying down on my very soft carpet and had this epiphany where I was like, this is such an incredibly blessed life because I know that in 15 minutes my roommate is going to come downstairs from his meeting and with no context find an inflatable UFO kids tent in our living room. And I started this podcast because I think a lot of these stories are stories that happened within my storytelling that a lot of people have never gotten to hear. And it's important to like realize that people can be going through so much more than you can see. And it's always 
okay to open up about things that you might not have felt comfortable doing like for me even six months ago and at the end of the day i'm still learning i'm still growing and i'm still questioning and i know that a lot of you are still questioning a lot of things about your gender identity and here i am a confused person to help you out so i have a few questions here that i would like to dive into because either i relate to them or i have them myself or i think i might have an answer for you How long did it take you to come out after you realized you were genderqueer? I think I'm still in the process of doing that. I guess this is me coming out because I've never really talked about my gender online before. But it took me a while because I think I had to feel comfortable within myself. And social media is a very interesting place to have to come out. As like a content creator, you have a very special connection with the people who follow you. You want them to feel like they really do have access to your life in a very special way, which of course they do. But there are still things, you know, you're figuring out behind the scenes that you just don't know how to talk about. Like I really never knew how to go on TikTok and be like, hey, I think I might be like non-binary, but like, I really don't know. But like, I really don't know how to figure it out. Like, like, what do you guys think? And then on top of that, coming out as non-binary, that's always going to be like a concrete thing. Like there's always going to be a concrete video that I sit down and I make and I'm like, hey guys, I'm non-binary. What if I change my mind? Like it's okay because I know that in the past I thought I was a straight person, then I thought I was bi, then I thought I was like completely a male man in this world. And now I'm figuring out that that was all just like a part of a journey to get to where I am with how I'm comfortable within myself. So I guess I'm still coming out because I'm still figuring out a lot of parts about myself. Time is a very important measure in your identity because if you know you know if you don't you don't <laughs> saying that again any advice for a genderqueer kid who always feels pressured to put a label on their gender i think the beautiful thing about this generation and about this time is that there are so many labels and there are so many terms that people can find comfort within but i think it can also be very scary because you got into this world and realize you're questioning things about yourself. So you Google like, yo, I might be trans, I might be non-binary, I might be genderqueer. And then they give you so many different options. And I am not somebody that does well with options. I just need a couple and then I might be able to pick one after like 15 minutes of staring at what food I want. So I think you really need to find a label that makes you the most comfortable. And if you are the most comfortable without one, stick with that. Because even with me, some days I feel non-binary. Some days I just feel like a human being existing in this world and I just want to live as that. And I think there shouldn't be any pressure to always put a label on how you feel. And that these labels are here to guide you and provide a little bit more clarity with the questions that you have, but never to definitively define yourself because you don't have to you can just feel a certain way and if somebody asks say you haven't figured it out yet and that's fine you can be on your deathbed and still be confused that's probably where i'm gonna be so no pressure guys here's an interesting question that i touched on a little bit earlier does questioning your gender identity correlate with your sexuality or the other way around at all my personal answer to that is absolutely not you can be attracted to a certain gender, multiple genders, all the genders, and then feel a different way about your gender and that has nothing to do with each other. I think sexuality generally tends to come first. Like that's how it went for me. Like, but I also think I grew up in an environment where like gender was just not a discussion at all. But I think that your gender and your sexuality are two very different entities. Like the way that you present versus the things that you are attracted to are very, like, they're mutually exclusive. Like they don't really have to touch if you don't think that you want them to. Like for me, I've always been attracted to women. That has genuinely never changed. Have I always felt the same way about my gender? No. And I think that that's like the same for a lot of people. Like you don't, have to define one bit of your identity on another. 
and that's okay. And then the last question, I love this question. Do you want to find a label for yourself or are you fine without one? I'm pretty cool without one. I've been coasting my most of my life without one. And that is genuinely what makes me feel the most comfortable. And it also is, I think, what speaks to me to continue to not really have one. I'm also very picky, like just in general. So being who I am, I think the space that I've created online for myself and like the person that I am in my everyday life has nothing to do with my identity. Like my personality and the way that I act and the way that I behave and my mannerisms really have nothing to do with how I present like to the internet. And I was talking to my dad about this a while ago because he asked me the same question. And he was like, I think it's really beautiful that you've created a space where you can just be you with no labels and you can be this kind of person to look up to if people are confused or lost or struggling or looking for a label for me to just be like, it's all right if you don't have one. It's all right if there's no word that you found that makes you feel the most comfortable about yourself. And I think that's like the main thing for me is I haven't really found a term that has a definition that I resonate with completely. And that's okay. Like I'm cool with not having one. It is not something that I need in my life. I'm just existing. Somebody who likes women. I, I don't know. There's like this also like I like to like look at men, but I also can't tell if like I'm attracted toward if I want to look like that. So there's also that. But in terms of like label for sexuality, I've never had one. I don't really know which one to pick. And then same with gender. I always say I like non-binary because of the non part and the fact that I use all pronouns. So there is that. No labels for the win, everyone. Live your life. I think the reason I wanted to do this was because there are things here that I've never really had the time or space to sit down and talk about. And I think being somebody who's pretty in the public eye and creates all these small little funny videos, I think it's important to fully like develop a human being. And I think I wanted to be fully developed as and seen as like a human being. And all this reflection and all this trauma and all of my past literally only existed in my mind and I think sitting down with so many friends over the years so many peers and even adults over the years and having conversations about the way we grew up and the way that we experienced the world it made me realize how truly similar everyone is and that we are all just one human experience the way that we have experience the world is also connected and we have so many experiences that like picking crushes and not knowing how to talk about boys and going through the struggles of being in the church and struggling with that identity because of the way that you were raised and being raised in a conservative environment and finally coming to terms with your sexuality and experimenting with your gender and meeting people who aren't going to support you and meeting people who for no reason are not going to like you. I just wanted to come on here and like, I guess share my experiences with that because so many of you tell me every single day that you are struggling with one of those things. I get it in comment sections, I get it in DMs. And I guess I just wanted to provide a little bit of that safe space because for so long in my life, I thought nothing was gonna be okay. I thought the world was ending almost every single moment until like, literally 20 years old was the first time that I wanted to truly provide and build a future for myself. And I know so many of you are in environments right now where if you're listening to this and you're not in a safe place to come out, you're not in a safe place where you can explore your gender identity, you're not in a safe place where you can fully express yourself in the way that you feel like you have to in order to continue on, there's going to be a time and a place in your life that you will get to where you're going to be able to do that. And I think if you're surrounded by those negative people, I was talking about this with my friends, the second that I left high school, the second that that cap was thrown into the air, all of that past and all of those experiences dulled a little bit. And I realized all of the people who had ne negatively affected my life, I never had to see again. 
and I never had to let into my space again. I wanted to talk about my experience because at 22, I have chosen my family and I have chosen the people that I want to be around that make me feel good about myself and that let me experiment with who I am and let me just be who I've always been. And I hope that each and every single one of you finds that because there's always hope. I, I'm such a firm believer in the fact that there's always hope because I have felt hopeless. Those are my closing thoughts on my new podcast, Closet Talk. Thank you for everyone who turned into all six episodes. You mean the world to me. If you haven't had enough of me, you want to see more of me, I'm around absolutely anywhere at Westbrook. When I say anywhere, I mean anywhere. Come back next week for a brand new episode of season two of Closet Talk, where I will unpack a new element of the queer experience and hear even more of your stories. Do not forget to follow, rate, and review Closet Talk wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe for full video episodes every single Friday. I will see you next week. Stay gay.